about that now. All right, over to the equities team. Yeah, I'm just gonna. I'm just sorting out. So one minute, sorry. Perfect. All right. Whilst we're waiting, uh, hopefully everyone saw the markets went down <laughs> awfully today. Um, <laughs> I'm sure my my best piece of advice is don't sell. Um, <laughs> if you see red and you panic, it's not good. It's not a good. You should always have a reason of why you are selling. If you cannot provide an actual comprehensive reason of why you want to sell then you shouldn't be selling. You should be buying more at, at the uh, at the bottom. But then again, it depends what particular, you know, growth stocks, you know, tech stocks are the ones that have suffered the most. Uh, and tech stocks have suffered the most because why? Anyone want to say why tech stocks have suffered the most? Just turn off your microphone and shout. Their valuations have been the highest. Their base, their valuations are based on future cash flows, which, with rising yields and inflation expectations, um, it gets discounted even more. So, um, yeah, their like valuations now are lower. So, if you could summarize that in one word, it would definitely be what word? Um, what, what's the big bad wolf which everyone's scared about? Inflation. Yeah, exactly. All right. Uh, um, I don't have permission yet, so... Um... Okay, let me make you co-host. All right, now you should have permission. Brilliant. All right, so I'm going to mute myself. It's completely over to you. Okay, so we decided to do uh, Aviva. Uh, and Aviva is, uh, so I'm going to do a company overview. So Aviva is uh, a provider of financial services, mainly in the UK, uh, which range from managing savings to home insurance. Uh, in the last few years, Aviva has made structural changes to its operating model um, to simplify it. And the simplification has, or is aiming to enable each business to focus on their priorities while still benefiting from the scale of Aviva as a whole. So we have the Investment Savings and Retirement Division, which manages uh, about £346 billion um, pounds, uh, of assets. Um, Aviva has a strong track record in this field, particularly in responsible investing. Uh, as the new strategy is implemented, Aviva will become the largest provider of savings and retirement services in the UK. Uh, we have the general insurance division, which helps protect customers in the event of damage to property and assets or personal injury. Some examples uh, include cars, homes, travel, pets and liability. Um, in terms of market share, Aviva is number one in the UK and second largest in both Canada, Canada and Ireland. And finally, the UK, Europe and Asia Life division. Um, this is part of the new streamlined strategy, but it's already a key generator, generator of cash flow. In the UK, Aviva focuses on annuities, equity release and insurance, whereas in Europe, they offer a range of insurance savings and investment services to over 8 million customers. And in Asia, it's mainly based in Singapore, uh, where, they are leader, where they are a leader in financial advisory services. Uh, in line with cutting down its portfolio, Aviva has closed some deals in the last few weeks where they sold off their French, Italian and Turkish businesses. In total, Aviva should receive more than £4 billion from planned sales of operations, which they can use to pay down debt and reinvest to generate growth. Um, moving forward, uh, Aviva aims to make the most of the shift towards ESG investing using their own expertise in the uh, sector, continue growing the business in Canada, where Aviva has a useful, useful partnership with the Royal Bank of Canada and increase automation and digitization uh, to improve cost efficiency. Yeah, so I'll just be talking about the industry a little bit. 
So uh, among regulation, technology, and shifting consumer expectations, the insurance industry has really increased its pace on transformation. Insurers have become more skilled in responding to new innovations, so especially surrounding real-time risk, risk pricing to movement into automation, agriculture, and health. Competition, specifically competing to create value for customers, is mainly what's driving the markets in this industry. In fact, 70% of insurance CEOs say that they will prioritize or invest in consumer experience in the next 12 months. However, the main challenge with this has been the increasing and changing consumer expectations. Another point to make is that sustainability has really been the talk of the town, with the top global companies keeping this at the center of their goals. The knowledge of health, climate, and financial inclusion would really allow the insurance industry to grow and for markets to flourish. Again, the persisting challenge with this is the weak trust in public-private partnerships. And so focusing on sustainability can really help them strengthen these relationships. The key player who would really be able to survive in such an industry uh, are those companies that can respond to unexpected events and turn them into opportunities that utilize innovation, create better quality for customers, and find solutions to problems much quicker. So just to give you an idea, the five largest company, insurance companies in the UK are, and you can see them on the screen as well, these are Aviva, who we're presenting today, Old Mutual, Prudential, RSA, and Direct Line. Uh, and just to wrap the industry analysis a little bit, uh, finally, uh, the fundamental requirement of sustaining in this industry has and always will be open-mindedness. Insurance companies should really be welcoming to new ideas in response to change. So they must hold on to and seek to upgrade their skill set, scale, and productivity and grab onto opportunities that create innovations, innovation and solutions in the market. Me. Yep, so um, I'm going to talk about the strengths and weaknesses of Aviva and the opportunities and threats that they face going forward. Um, so Aviva has been successful in developing new products to increase their customer base. Um, they've also successfully integrated a number of tech companies in the past few years to streamline um, their operations and build a reliable supply chain. Um, in 2019, they acquired NEOS. I'm a smart insurance tech provider, which helps customers to monitor and protect homes. Um, they believe in um, preventing um, like things from happening um, while also protecting. So um, that's why they acquired um, NEOS there. Um, they've also had superb performance in new markets. Um, this demonstrates Aviva's ability to adapt and penetrate new markets. Although they are now selling some businesses, um, some business units in foreign countries, to focus on the core markets. Um, so some weaknesses, um, although Aviva is one of the leaders in the industry, um, it's faced challenges um, in moving to other product segments um, with its present culture. So they haven't been able to really adapt to um, um, different um, like business products with the current um, um, culture they have. So that's, quite, um, that's a problem they have with um, their growth story going forward. Um, they have gaps in the product range, and this gives competitors um, like a good foothold in the market. And they they also haven't been able to tackle the challenges presented by new competitors. Um, they've lost a small market share in the niche in the niche categories. So Aviva needs to build um, an internal feedback mechanism directly from the sales team to counter these challenges and find out what um, customers want, so they can provide that going forward. Um, this is so they don't lose market share to um, smaller competitors, as it always um, adds up in the end. Um, as mentioned earlier, even though Aviva has um, had successful integration with small companies, it tends to not merge well with firms that have different work culture. Um, so this could hinder growth going forward if they do want to explore different um, growth possibilities by merging with um, companies in kind of different areas to what they are currently in. Um, so some opportunities that um, um, Aviva might um, might have. Um, they have stable free cash flow, which provides opportunities to invest in adjacent um, product segments. And also changes in the industry will lead to dilution of competitors' um, advantages. 
And um, if Aviva can innovate and move with the times, they will be able to increase their competitiveness compared to um, their competitors um, as um, the industry changes and um, customers are looking for different things. Um, so just a um, few threats that Aviva may um, face. So new technologies developed by um, the competitor or a market disruptor could be a serious threat to the industry in the medium or long term. Um, rising pay levels, especially movements such as the $15 an hour and increasing prices in China can lead to serious pressure on the prof profitability of Aviva. Um, also increased um, competition puts downward pressures on sales and profit margins um, for Aviva and this is something they might have to um, look to and again um, innovate and um, become more competitive um, compared with the um, industry um, players. So I am going to talk through the CanSlim analysis. So Aviva's earnings per share growth was 128.8, 9.4 and 67% in 2017, 18 and 19 respectively. The 2017 and 2019 results are much higher than the benchmark of 25% that we are looking for. The lower 2018 result is reasonable given the massive increase the year before and not something we are concerned about. Their earnings report came out today, giving us that their earnings per share for growth, earnings per share growth for 2020 was 10%. This beat the expectation of minus 20.7% massively. And although it is not above the benchmark, it is excellent in the context of COVID-19. Overall, their earnings per share have been increasing year on year, although the growth is not steady. In July 2020, Amanda Blank took over as CEO of Aviva. She is also a senior advisor at Trob Inc., used to be the CEO of ABI, and was a board member of Aviva before she became CEO. Overall, she has had senior roles in companies that specialize in areas that are key drivers of success in this industry, namely technological innovation and customer service. Aviva has a large economic moat as it is a hassle for customers to change insurance companies. I am optimistic that they are actively working on implementing their new strategy of paying down their debt before increasing dividends as this strategy prioritizes what the company needs. A low debt to equity ratio like that of Aviva's can be used to indicate excess demand and an environment in which stock prices can rise dramatically. Certainly it needs to be below two, so 0.5 is good. They have leading positions in the UK, Ireland and Canada and are focusing on their business in these countries. They have institutional sponsorship by large reputable companies BlackRock, Vanguard and Barclays hold the largest proportion of shares in Aviva. There is an overwhelming consensus to buy and the proportion of buy ratings has mostly increased since March and has been strictly increasing since August. Aviva makes up 0.8% of the FTSE 100. There is a lot of optimism in the market uh, because of the vaccine rollout and we're considering the FTSE 100 because it is a British company. Uh, on to the conclusion. Yeah, to, um, to sum up then, as we've seen, Aviva has strong fundamentals, high EPS growth, and is currently at a large discount to its intrinsic value. It's also a market leader in the countries it operates in, allowing Aviva to benefit from being a large scale firm and it has long term experience in the ESG field, which will help it make the most of the move towards sustainable investing. We believe Aviva is well positioned to grow its core, more profitable businesses and take advantage of its brand, expertise and economic moat to continue growing and potentially become the largest provider of financial services in the UK. Amazing. Really, really good, everyone who worked on that. Um, if anyone's got any questions, anything they want to they want to clarify, any challenges to why you should buy Aviva now, that would be great. 
Um, I've got a question. What's the price target which you think Aviva is going to go to? How high do you think it's going to be? Where, where should someone buy in? And that could be to any, anyone who wants to respond on, on the team. Well, we started working on this about a week ago. And even since then, the price has gone up about 7 8%. Uh, just in a week, um, yeah. where it's it's, it's uh, annual report came out today, so I think that was a big factor. Um, so I think there's a lot of growth potential in this. Um, the consensus, so like the average price target, I think uh, was around 401 pence per share. Um, but I think we all think that you can go a lot higher, 450 easily uh, in the next few months, maybe in 500 by um, by summertime, end of summer. So yeah, I think there's we think there's a lot of growth in this sure I've, I've got to add on to that oh, yeah okay go, go, go yeah add on to that and then i'll add, add one more point uh so we did a dcf analysis um and on bloomberg and that came up with um with one method that the um estimated value per share was uh, 765.78 and um with another method it was 738 pounds and 91 pence so a massive upside um on what time horizon was that over a year a month <laughs> uh this is i think this is just what it can get to i think because of covid i think it might take a little bit longer to get there um but they're certainly acting on on improving the company and doing a lot to get there so i think that they definitely have room for growth in the future yeah and just, just on the back of that you spoke a lot about you know analysts other analyst price targets which you got on bloomberg is it a coincidence that because the technicals so the the price was moving upwards so the analysts just changed their buy ratings to higher and higher and higher um, obviously if you're an analyst working in the bank and the price is moving you should up your price target so how valid are those buy signals do you think Well, I think that uh, because of the uh, DCF that we did, um, that puts the price at uh, well above well above the um, analysts' target targets, and so because of that, I think that they're moving up their their um, targets is uh, is quite valid in this. Circumstances. Okay, so essentially, essentially you're saying yeah. it's fundamentals, it's fundamentals, yeah. right? And also because their earnings came out today and they were better than expected, so it makes sense that they've increased their target. Yeah, of course. Um, anyone else got any other questions? Yeah, just adding on to that, um, yeah, I'd say it's, it's probably fundamental driven. I mean, um, the stock's moving now because of... Um, how the UK has been so successful with the vaccine rollout. So, um, I mean, as that moves the stock price, um, analysts are given basically new evidence every day um, with the fundamentals changing of the economy and everything. So, um, I think they're quite right to put up their, um, their price targets. So, yeah, they're just um, probably moving with like how, how they believe um, the economy is moving as well. Yeah, it's a fair point. All right, I'm conscious of time. Amazing presentation. Um, the FX guys can go next. George, uh, do I need to make you co-host or are you already? You're, you're muted. I'm already co-host. Let me just go. And uh, Raul, you can request access now. Yeah, I think I've done that. And there we go. All right, you, you can start. Okay. So today we'll be presenting to you why we think uh, we should invest in this currency pair. Screen is, there we go. Right, so uh, this is the table of contents. It's just a rundown of what we're going to be presenting today. And uh, we're going to start with a basic overview of our fundamental reasons for investing in the Mexican peso, because FX is not usually fundamentally driven. But that's what we're going, because we're thinking of long term. 
uh, some technical analysis to back up our fundamentals, uh, breaking down the dollar and what we think will happen in the next coming months, um, our conclusion and the key factors. So, as I mentioned earlier, as our mission statement, we're here to kind of present why we are considering putting 10% of our allocation towards this position. Oh, we're setting the stop loss, of course, because we're prone to error and all of that. And we'll discuss that later on. So basic overview. So just to give uh, a brief kind of understanding of how it works, because Forex can be quite confusing. So MXN, which is the Mexican peso, is the base currency. Uh, and then USD is the quote currency. And a good way of kind of trying to understand how it works in terms of trying to get returns is that if the peso strengthens uh, and then the kind of the dollar weakens, kind of higher returns are established. And just as a kind of, although this is not a, a traditional kind of currency pair to invest in, it is still quite popular as it's kind of the ninth most traded currency pair on the market. So to give kind of a basic overview uh, of both kind of countries, because looking at kind of the current situation uh, and the macroeconomics is kind of essential to the fundamental analysis. And a lot of the kind of basic focus on the macro front is obviously toward, towards kind of how the countries are responding to Corona. And although Mexico initially had uh, kind of some slip ups now kind of the vaccine rollout uh, is in full force, as you can see it's released uh, received 200,000 Sputnik vaccines and it's expected to receive 2.4 and the key kind of fact is that th it had the third highest uh, death toll in the world, which shows that kind of the level of growth it can achieve uh, through kind of uh, an appropriate kind of coronavirus response and the kind of natural growth of the economy. And now to kind of get a perspective uh, in terms of the US, uh, recently, I'm sure you've all heard about kind of the single dose of Johnson & Johnson being cleared. Uh, I think the US was the most hit by Corona, as you're all aware. And although we'll kind of get onto this later, uh, when we dig into kind of the dollar and the fiscal response, uh, the House of Representatives have passed this 1.9 trillion stimulus. Uh, package, but there is still uh, a level of concern in terms of uh, how Corona can still impact the US, even with the kind of the vaccine getting rolled out. Right. So uh, basically, as Raul mentioned, uh, COVID, uh, that's, COVID wasn't good for Mexico. Uh, as you can see here, the economy really crashed in 2020 uh, by, by a large percentage, actually. And here's a graph that's more accurate. It shows you a, a lower time scale. So you can more accurately see that around March, uh, basically, the Mexican peso just dropped. And it's been on an upward trend since then. And now we're going to discuss some of the fundamental analysis that we did. Right, so uh, this over here is back to the GDP. Uh, the CPI, which is indicative of the inflation and in turn, is very important. In uh, quantifying the GDP. Uh, these are the projected GDP growths. Uh, the, these are forecasts for uh, the Mexican GDP. And as you can tell, they're much higher than they were pre-COVID, and they're definitely much higher than 2019 and 20. Here's a closer look at the forecasts, uh, quarter by quarter. As you can tell, quarter one is not expected to do too well, but the forecasts for quarter two, and I've highlighted it down here, uh, are much higher. 15.8% 15, 15 is a large percentage to grow in, on a year-on-year -year basis. And these are different brand, banks and their different projections. As you can tell, it varies depending on the bank, but that's natural. Uh, so the interest rates have also decreased, which is also very good for their currency, from 4.25% to 4, which uh, definitely encourages spending and all. So as we mentioned earlier, kind of the macros form the kind of basis of the fundamentals. And br we've broken it down into like the fiscal and monetary policy. Um, so looking at the fiscal, what's interesting to see is that through kind of 
all the mishaps that coronavirus has caused, we're still seeing kind of a fiscal response from Mexico more focused on kind of tax reformation rather than changing the amount of taxes being brought in. And although that uh, might not necessarily like contribute massively, but it is still something you need to kind of consider going forward in terms of kind of investing in this currency pair. And then, as George mentioned about kind of the monetary policy and the interest rates, they're planning on dropping it to uh, 4%, which, as you mentioned, will encourage the kind of spending. And their kind of inflation, they're hoping to uh, bring down to a level of 2.7%. Uh, and as you can see, it's currently at 354 And it's all about kind of maintaining this sustained economic growth. Uh, but not trying to kind of overinflate the economy, making the currency too strong and then having any crashes later later on. Right, so uh, the main driving point for why we're deciding to buy this pair is the amount of tourists that are going to be coming into Mexico uh, from the US. And as is mentioned over here, uh, tourism accounts for 15% of, of Mexico's economy. So when all these tourists come back from the US and they've all been sitting at, sitting at home in a series of lockdowns, things like that, they're going to come in and spend a lot, which will increase like the, uh, it will boost the GDP of Mexico and increase like the demand for the Mexican peso, which essentially will bring up its price. Uh, these are some statistics over here about how fewer uh, visitors came into Mexico and all. And, uh, yeah, that's generally it in terms of tourism. Uh, commodities as well. Uh, this comes into exports. Uh, Mexico exports lots of silver, gold, copper, and oil, all of which, compared to the previous years, are up in price, which will boost their GDP, uh, no doubt. And these are just some uh, silver price projections from various companies, uh, JP Morgan, banks, things like that. Another big factor to consider is Joe Biden coming into kind of uh, power and how that kind of will play a, a big role in both kind of countries' economic situations. We've seen obviously with Donald Trump, as I've said at the bottom, quite a sledgehammer approach, whereas Biden uh, has already kind of, although we, we will see how it develops, but for now he is said uh, to be kind of quite receptive uh, to negotiations with Mexico. Even Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of, Secretary of State, uh, has insisted that during these kind of international tours that he's having with some of the uh, big uh, friends of America, like Canada, Mexico, he's insisted there would be cooperation. And big things like Biden ending the Remain in Mexico program uh, all contribute to, um, hopefully, uh, a better economy for Mexico and a better relationship with America. And this is just, uh, it's important to kind of keep up to date with forecasts and what's actually being uh, produced. And these are all the kind of important dates that we will be following and have already followed uh, in terms of uh, all the key kind of economic releases Mexico have had. Uh, so now we're going to go into some of the technical analysis. And uh, you have to keep in mind that we're trying to invest in Forex on the long term. So this would vary very differently than someone who would technically analyze uh, the Mexican peso for a two hour position or maybe a two day position. Uh, so we're using a one month time frame, obviously, to make sure that our uh, technical analysis is relevant to anything. And as you can see here, uh, this over here is called divergence. Uh, and it's indicative of an upward trend that's going to follow, uh, which is bullish, uh, which is good for us. And this over here is a support level. I'm not sure if you see my mouse, but uh, this rectangle is a support level. And uh, basically, we're not invested yet. We haven't put a position in, but we're waiting to see how it performs in the next few weeks. And if it bounces off of this support, we're purchasing, we're buying. As with kind of any Forex pair, it's as much as we've kind of focused on uh, the Mexican peso, you also have to consider any implications uh, uh, in the other countries. So the US, 
Um, and what we've seen in terms of kind of fiscal response uh, is very, very heavy spending. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Biden's approved of that 1.9 trillion stimulus uh, package. And in terms of the monetary policy, we're seeing quite kind of an ultra dovish approach. Um, and Jerome Powell, kind of the Fed of the, uh, sorry, the chairman of the Federal Reserve has stressed that uh, he, he needs the patience uh, of all of the Americans to keep the monetary policy loose. And we're seeing more of a focus on the kind of physical response, but there is kind of some doubts, for example, George Schultz, who's quite uh, a famous American uh, economist uh, said that we have to be careful with this kind of approach that uh, of spending heavily uh, with these stimulus packages because it is quite a short-sighted view. So to conclude, uh, these are the general things we're keeping in mind. Our long-term investment entails a six month to one year uh, position. It's how long we're going to keep it open. And uh, we're always going to watch these uh, key factors over here. I already mentioned my our entry position. It's going to be around where the support is. And here are other key factors we're going to keep looking out for. Yeah, so these are like kind of the summary of things that we will bear in mind uh, in case we need to kind of sell our investment and then reinvest. Like we'll be following how accurately these kind of claims from Biden and Anthony Blinken, like how they actually plan out and whether this kind of relationship uh, develops. Uh, and also we will be watching things like the US bond yields. We'll be seeing if the forecasts for the kind of the pressure of metals are consistent uh, with the forecast and also look at how uh, coronavirus plays a part in both economies. Right, so in general, we're banking on uh, US tourists and other tourists coming into Mexico, which in turn will boost the demand for the peso. And we have reason to believe that that will be significant. Uh, there is academic literature that compares uh, the Roaring Twenties 100 years ago after the Spanish flu to what's supposed to happen now. Uh, I've put some links at the end that if anyone wants to do some further reading on them on this, uh, I can send to. Uh, these are just some articles I was reading earlier today. And thank you. Amazing. George, if you want to just copy and paste them and put them in the chat, yeah. that'd be amazing. Uh, we've got two questions from Ryan and Alex. Uh, Ryan, if you want to turn off your microphone and just say your question, that would be good. Yeah, sure. Just give me a second. Uh, so what I'm just speaking off the top of my head, but what do you think the Biden administration taking a softer stance on immigration Will it lead to more investors and workforce moving from Mexico into the US because there are more opportunities now? That's just my question. Thank you. Right. So uh, Raul mentioned that uh, Biden expanded something called the right to remain, essentially. And what that does is uh, it basically shows that the Biden administration is ready to let Mexican people in. It's softening restrictions, not keeping them in cages, as Trump's administration did. And they're overall taking a softer stance on them. Another key thing in terms of kind of the negotiations, I think the Mexican president, one of the big like things he was going to push is that the US economy needs uh, this kind of consistent intake uh, of Mexican immigrants to actually sustain kind of their growth and potential in the economy. Do you think that would lead to more pesos moving out of Mexico and into the US as we to strengthen the US dollars because more people are moving there? Well, in general, um, when people move out of Mexico to the US, they're going there to earn money and get jobs in order to send USD back to their families, right? Uh, and I don't think that would be a significant moving factor. I don't think a big source of outflow of Mexican peso is uh, immigrants that are moving out to work, taking it with them. So no, we don't think that's a major factor. All right, thank you. No worries. All right, Alex, go ahead. So I think you mentioned that there would be 2 million vaccines in, like, rolled out in Mexico. And I think the, uh, the Mexican population is like 127 million. So like, overall, that's like 1.8% of the population that will be vaccinated. And I'm assuming that they do what we did here, like, like um, vaccinated um, the people who, like, uh, who are elderly or vulnerable, and, you know, like, um, instead of, like, the workforce, would that really bring more money into Mexico? 
I think the the key with kind of that thing is that we are, although yeah, proportionally, it may not be kind of uh, the percentages necessarily, but it's kind of moving in the right direction. Like for now, these are the kind of statements they're putting out, and naturally, obviously, it's not going to be a, a instant, heavy, heavy kind of shipments of vaccines being received, but. We're seeing uh, more consistent uh, kind of news coming out of Mexico, out of shipments being received, and it's moving in the right direction. Cheers. So, if anyone has any more questions, don't don't be afraid to ask. Give it ten seconds. Um, I thought that was a great presentation. You've clearly thought about the. Uh, geopolitics between the two countries which is excellent that's exactly what I wanted to see at the end of the day um, whether there are good relations between the Mexico and US it is very important especially both, both of their economic policies uh, good good work and the technicals yeah obviously uh, this fund isn't a day trading fund we're not going to do 150 time leverage <laughs> on a two hour time frame it's going to be more you know, macro driven looking at these uh, factors at, from both countries' point of view. Um, so, yeah, have you got, a, have you got a pro your price target is waiting until it hits the resistance line uh, or, or the support line, as you said. What happens if it bounces before the support line? Could that indicate a higher support? Well, yes, it could. Uh... We haven't exactly uh, invested yet, as I mentioned, but yeah. we will be mon mon monitoring, monitoring it over the next weeks. And uh, if you remember how the graph looked like, uh, th the movement is in sort of a downward trend right now. So we will be mon monitoring it closely, but we haven't made like a final decision yet, but we're looking at it. Good. Yeah, excellent. Uh, that's, that's really good. It's clear that you both a lot of research in, into both countries. Because at the end of the day, you don't hear about Mexican economic policies on the front page of the FT. It's not what um, me or as I don't think many people here look at every day. Uh, but if you're a Forex trader, that's the sort of thing you'll be looking at every day. Yeah, what's, what's the key economic indicators in Mexico? That kind of thing. All right, I'll call it there. Um, brilliant. All right, next we have Ryan talking about Alibaba. So Ryan, if you want to share your screen, okay. you've got about 17 minutes to yeah, present and sure. questions inclusive. Yeah. Cool. Mine is just like a report that I did, so it's not really a presentation. So I'll just take you through the report. Cool. Um, one second. Yeah, so, okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to be presenting on Alibaba. So Alibaba is um, a Chinese multinational company specializing in a range of different um, platforms of so e-commerce, retail, internet and technology. Um, Alibaba accounted for reported 53% of all online retail sales in China in 2020, and they have three core businesses. So um, I'll just take you through those three. Um, so Alibaba is a business to business trading platform. Um, they connect uh, manufacturers and wholesalers with buyers from around the world. Uh, merchants pay annual sellers fees and sales commissions to Alibaba. Um, they have another one called Tabao. Um, they, um, Tabao is where um, they have hundreds of millions of products and services from millions of sellers. Um, their revenue from this is mainly from advertising fees paid by merchants who want to stand out from literally millions of competitors. Um, and they have Tamal, which... Um, is where branded products are offered and um, they are more focused on larger companies, including multinational brands such as Nike and Apple. Um, Tomorrow charges merchants a deposit fee, um, an annual fee and a commission fee um, on transactions. Um, another notable business component of Alibaba is Alibaba Cloud. Um, this recently became profitable for the first time in the last quarter. Um, Alibaba Cloud incorporates, incorporates everything from database, storage, big data, analytics, um, security and machine learning. Um, 
Yeah, Alibaba Cloud has dominated China's cloud infrastructure market for the past few years, and its market share worldwide continues to grow. Um, as of 2019, the cloud um, was the third largest public cloud company in the world with a 9% market, trailing behind Amazon and Microsoft. Um, yeah, so they, they have a few competitors. Um, just on the e-commerce side, I, I didn't um, include Amazon and Shopify as the, um, in this section, but they will be included in like the comparable company analysis when looking at valuations. Um, I've mainly looked at three um, e-commerce companies um, which are in the markets that Alibaba competes in. So um, there's JD.com, which is Alibaba's probably main competitor in China. Um, their um, annual active customer accounts have increased um, a lot in 2020. Um, the same goes for their revenue, it's increased a lot. However, um, the way they operate is very different to um, Alibaba. They operate with um, holding um, inventory, whereas Alibaba doesn't, which means their margins are a lot smaller than Alibaba's. Um, then the C Limited. Um, so this um, stands for this. This is a Southeast it's a Southeast Asian company. Um, they um, have three divisions with significant tailwinds. So they're gaming, e-commerce, and payments. Um, they're operating in a region which is seeing a lot of um, which is seeing a lot um, of growing middle class people and increasing internet penetration levels. Um, They've beaten Alibaba in terms of um, um, gross merchandise volume in um, Southeast Asia. However, this does present um, quite a big opportunity if Alibaba can penetrate this uh, market. And then there's also Mercado Libra, which operates in Latin America. Um, again, they've been able to compete, um, um, to, to be off competition against um, Amazon and Alibaba to become leader in the region. However, there's still so much growth in that market that um, there's still a big opportunity for Alibaba to penetrate. So it's not a foregone conclusion that Mercado Libre is going to dominate the um, Latin American market forever. And then just looking on a um, valuation basis, um, I've included a few metrics here, um, forward PE, um, price sales, and net profit margin. Um, so the table above um, shows that um, Alibaba is perhaps undervalued when future growth is taken into account. Um, the forward PE is 90% below the average, excluding C, because C um, doesn't have a make profit yet. Um, I think this, from my from my um, from my perspective, I believe that this means that um, investors are not expecting Alibaba to have as rapid growth as the other four companies. Um, this is something I'll consider later on in the report, but. Um, I believe that Alibaba does have quite um, a lot of growth in the coming in the future. Um, also, Alibaba's price sales is the third lowest compared to industry peers, 72% um, below the average of the six companies. Again, this may indicate that Alibaba is undervalued as investors may be discounting their ability to penetrate new markets, um, whilst overestimating maybe C um, and Shopify's um, ability to continue to gain market share in the respective regions. Um, the high net profit margin for Alibaba is most likely because they do not hold any inventory. Um, so if Alibaba can continue to increase sales and add customers to their platform, their share price is likely to benefit hugely. Um, their net profit should continue to trend upwards um, also as Alibaba's um, cloud computing component becomes more profitable too. So um, just looking at where Alibaba can grow. So Alibaba... Um, it's one of the largest e-commerce on, and online companies in the world. Um, they, they're made of a lot of um, core components, but the e-commerce component is the largest. Um, China's growth story of its rising middle class and shift towards online shopping will continue to drive Alibaba's top line figures higher. Um, well, the COVID um, pandemic is kind of over in China. So um, although that did kind of accelerate the shift towards e-commerce and allow um, Alibaba to grow a lot in 2020, um, which was reflected in the share price as it hit all-time highs in October. Um, yeah, in the next decade, China's GDP is forecast to grow at least 5% um, annually, um, while its internet and cloud computing markets are forecast to grow 10% and 16% respectively. So Alibaba should benefit from this um, due to increased e-commerce sales and cloud computing sales. Um, 
if Alibaba can maintain the high net profit margin for their e-commerce and continue to improve the cloud net profit margin, this should benefit their top and bottom line. Um, competition in China's cloud computing space is tough, but Alibaba already has an estimated 50% market share, um, which should make its journey to a similar profit margin um, compared to Amazon's 30% odd. And we, of course, we know that um, AWS is the like biggest component of Amazon's profit. So um, e-commerce is what dominates um, Alibaba's profit right now. So again, if margins can even come comparable to what Amazon has, um, or even, even a fraction of that, then it will be um, significant for Alibaba. Um, also, their next growth driver, I was, I was looking at um, how Alibaba doesn't really have a strong subscription base as of yet. They're trying to improve this. They have um, membership programs um, such as 88 VIP um, and um, Tobao Pass. Um, these these um, subscription um, subscriptions can provide an economic moat for um, Alibaba. Um, they only have 35 million um, paid members right now. However, if they can grow this, such as what Amazon Prime has, um, it, it um, provides an economic moat um, when they are faced with regulatory um, headwinds. It um, allows them to um, keep their users. And again, this um, this is a strong bullish factor for Alibaba stock, given the um, reg regulatory hurdles and rise in competition faced by the company. Um, this is something that probably isn't reflected in the stock price. Um, if they can grow this um, and even release any numbers to um, show how it's growing and how it does affect their profit, um, we might see um, their stock price increase just as people incorporate different things into the stock price, such as like the cloud, um, the cloud component, the e-commerce component, and maybe the subscription component. Um, I think everyone knows that Alibaba has faced um, regulatory issues um, in the past six months. So firstly, um, um, Ant Group's dual listing was suspended in November of 2020, and this um, collapsed Alibaba's share price quite um, from its all-time highs. Um, they have a 33% stake in Ant Group, and um, people were, was, were kind of wondering why um, Chinese regulators stopped the, um, the IPO. And people think it's to do with Jack Ma, um, Alibaba's founder and Ant chairman, um, when he spoke about China's, when he spoke out against China's financial regulation, um, people think that China, the Chinese regulators, kind of took this a bit personal, and um, maybe stopped the IPO as kind of a way to put their foot down. And again, we've seen how they've um, tried to um, impose um, like investigations on Alibaba. Um, they announced that they're going to they open investigation into Alibaba over monopolistic practices. Um, the primary issue was named um, that they force merchants to choose one of two platforms rather than be able to work with both. Um, again, this spooked um, Wall Street and Barber shares fell considerably again. And I think um, altogether these these regulatory issues aren't too big of big of an issue. And I think the um, the stock price um, was was um, was like slashed um, quite um, was quite exaggerated how it fell quite so much and um, that's why I think right now it could be a good time to buy because it's unlikely that um, the Chinese regulators are going to impose any big restrictions that are going to damage such a big company in China. Um, the Chinese authorities have been known to um, kind of help help and promote their um, companies. So I don't think this is something that will um, really weigh on their, their company. And so perhaps um, it was over exaggerated the uh, fall in the stock price. Um, I, I did a discounted cash flow model of my own. Um, it might not be 100% right, like there might still be issues, but I did come to a intrinsic value of $317 per share. Um, so right now, well, not right now, this was um, as of the 2nd of March, Alibaba share price was at $238. So this gives about 33% of upside from its current share price to the calculated price of the DCF model. Um, again, it just suggests that Alibaba is very undervalued. 
Um, it has fallen since then, as we've seen like the big sell off in the US markets. So right now I think it's about 229 or 230. Um, just to conclude, um, at this current price level, I believe Alibaba is a good buy. Um, due to the regulatory headwinds that they face, um, that they faced in the six, past six months, Alibaba's share price has fallen considerably from all time highs of around $320. Um, I believe these regulatory issues will not damage Alibaba's business in the long term and that no severe actions will follow. Um, compared to industry peers, Alibaba's trading at a much lower valuation, making it uh, more attractive at this level. The growth opportunities um, for Alibaba are immense. The cloud business has only just become profitable in the last quarter. And with a 16% compound annual growth rate in China's cloud computing space, Alibaba stands to benefit from this in a huge way. Also, if Alibaba can successfully build a strong paid membership base, it'll be a strong moat built by the company. I also believe that with the size and scale of Alibaba, there are other business areas which they'll try their hand in. Um, and we won't know this immediately, but again, it just there'll just be more things in the future that Alibaba can um, can go into. Yeah, thank you. Brilliant. That was definitely a, a very, very comprehensive. Um, any questions, put it in the chat, say it out loud, don't be shy. Anyone? If, if not, then I've got a question. So you've really put an emphasis, uh, a really clear emphasis on Alibaba's uh, web service um, competing with Amazon web service. Um, what clear indicators are there that Alibaba can achieve Amazon status as like web server, you know, champion? Like, what, what makes, if it's so easy to do, uh, obviously yeah. it's not true, why can't they just do it tomorrow? Why is, why is Amazon so far ahead of the game than everyone else? Um, I think with Amazon Web Services, you kind of see them dominating the Western side of the world. Um, where China mainly operates, um, a lot of them, it's a lot of them, a lot of the a big portion of the market they're trying to tap into don't really have the um, infrastructure and like the the means to actually use um, um, Alibaba's um, cloud computing as as um, the side the work the side of the world they're operating in. Um, develops and grows, I think we'll see more growth in um, Alibaba's cloud computing. I mean, I was only watching, I was watching the football um, thing the other day where Bayern Munich were playing in Qatar. And you know how um, AWS powers like some football matches, um, how they're being streamed and showed. Um, it was actually being powered by um, uh, Barbara's cloud computing servers. So I thought that was quite interesting because I was writing at the same time as watching it. And yeah, it was just funny to see. So um, yeah, I think as um like china grows and just the eastern side of the world grows and we'll see um alibaba's cloud computing service to cool. grow as well hirsch has got a question hirsch if you want to turn off your microphone and say it that'd be great yeah how do you rate uh alibaba's ai and deep mind development compared to google uh, that's so, something yeah, self-driving cars and things yeah that's something i haven't really probably looked into which i should have but um I think when it comes to AI and um, that kind of stuff, I think there's other companies in China who are trying to um, tap into that. I think um, Baidu is the one that is um, kind of going into that one as well. I know Arc have invested a lot into them. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure really how Alibaba is faring into that, but um, I know I'm, I'm pretty sure that they are probably trying to tap into that market. And um, it's probably not as comprehensive as um, Google's as of yet because there has not been, I think, much reported on it. But um, yeah, um, that's all I can really say for now with what I know. I would say thank you for being honest that you didn't do a lot of research yeah. into it. It's uh, it, it's one thing to try and just blag it and, and just try and make it up on the spot. But when it comes to research reports, and it's important that if you don't know something or you're in front of a client, you don't know something and you say, sorry, yeah. I don't know. That, that's uh, people do appreciate that all right i'm going to stop the recording here um